How and why were you caught thus in the war? And as a politician say, that's not the question. Where was I caught in the world? Before I start the physical description, I'd just like to tell you a couple of things about where did the actual war catch us at 1355 on the 6th of October. We were in the actual eye of the storm of that parade of the what were they, we called the stupid parade, basically. But there was a whole list of errors that should not have been erred with and a whole collection of mishaps and mistakes that should not have been taken. And had those been saved, and I'm not talking about the low probability and the lack of mobilization of reserve reserves, And Dad, oh, by the way, only actually at the meeting at six o'clock in the morning with Diane, at six o'clock in the morning, only then did he ask to actually mobilize the reserve forces. Had all that not been carried out and all those mistakes, then within a matter of four or five days, that war could have been ended with, yes, plenty of casualties and fatalities to the Egyptians, but a minimum to us. And now, but I'm talking about the Southern Command with all its divisions and companies that were there. I'm talking about about just a day before the war. And a war that is about to break out. I mean, Zamir knows about it the day before at 10 o'clock at night, Zamir. And Golda knows it at 4 o'clock in the morning on Yom Kippur. Dado knows it at 4.30. And I am asleep on the mitle. I mean, deep asleep. No one has said anything to me. In other words, I'm only a third, responsible for a third of the, the, the Suez Canal. And it's a normal day of routine security, observations, patrols, opening of the axes. And now I'm actually, I'm, I fast because it's on Yom Kippur. So I sleep. The more you sleep, then there's less, less hours to fast on on the Day of Atonement. And suddenly someone sort of rock, knocks on the door of my caravan and they say, listen, There are all sorts of various issues going on and commands. So just go and find out what's happening. You know, I suddenly said, maybe turn on the radio and see what's happening. And I tell the, you know, the driver in the Jeep. And I was, by the way, at that time, I was in Brigade 14. And no one's talking about a war, by the way. At 12.50... Because we managed to intercept one United Nations kind of some kind of transmission, and Tassa tells us now you've got to do what was called the Shevach Yonim, the, the dove uh, pitch. Now, don't be confused by it to any degree. There was no defense program for Sinai, and when they said the dove. Um, and when they say Shevach Yonim, which was a code name for sending the tanks out, no, just into day parking areas, not into actually specific strategic positions. But that was the idea that they used to go out and simply sit outside. So they said Shevach Yonim. In other words, you're supposed to send the tanks out into the open. That's all. So 12, we're talking about 1.50. We could have been after a preemptive strike, but not what Dado suggested that should be in the depths of Syria. That would have had absolutely no operational significance whatsoever. We could, had, if we were so frightened of the Americans, we could have been four men. We have other people here. We could have been at least after preparations for a parallel strike or parallel attack. That's what the, um, the Air Force told us. We could have already actually attacked and hit at, their, at the equipment that they were going to actually cross the Suez Canal with. And nearly everyone is neutralized because they're just exchanging artillery and doing things. And... They didn't want to carry out the, um, the actual aid for the ground forces in case of a catastrophe. And believe me, it was a catastrophe. At 12 o'clock that day, the second meeting with Gorodish and Dado, they talk about the counterattack. But the general, 
the chief of staff doesn't actually check when to actually put their regular or back actually and add them in. They're all talking about the Shavach Yonim, in other words, sending out the tanks. In other words, they could either be two in the front and 401 um, is supposed to be arriving as well. So are we talk about one in the front or two in the front. And just think about the difference. And amongst them as well, Dado and Gorodish do not understand what these this term, this code name, Shavach Yonim, really means. So we're there in the positions, in the outposts, because there was a command not to leave those spots, those positions. Why? Because Gorodish had coined a term called escalation. Now, it's not something I actually... Um, invented that or coined that term. But when I said, for example, um, Brigade 401 um, was supposed to come in, are they actually moving? Are they on the wheels? And they said, no, 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 they're frightened of escalation. In other words, should they see the sand of the wheels of our armored tanks, the Egyptians will be too frightened. And if they hadn't actually attacked us beforehand already, they would be frightened because they saw that the escalation. But Gorodish wanted the 401 but, um, a brigade to do something in the north, basically. And at the same time, the, Air the Egyptian Air Force is attacking us alongst all the outposts and positions. And at exactly the same time, these outposts have become a terrible burden because we know that the moment that war has broken out, the command that should have been, that we should have received um, to evacuate all of those positions immediately or within the next few hours was not given. It would have changed the war totally because it was a terrible burden and because we knew that all the casualties were going to be there. And Amir Oren, you asked me, where were you? What did you do? Okay. So I was, I, was at, I was at the broad access towards the giddy. And, and there you can imagine exactly what it looked like. And I'm just, and, I'm, and I suddenly see the lower bellies of the phantoms. And I say, what on earth are they flying on a Yom Kippur? Don't forget that this was already my fourth war at that time. And I'm looking and the coin, the penny doesn't drop that I can hear actual bombardment on the eastern side. I can say Um Sheba is actually there's fire coming out and smoke. I can see that the whole canal uh, is actually there's suddenly artillery. And I said, quick open up and he opens a tin of food don't forget we're talking about yom kippur and the 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 driver is driving with the commander of the company by the way who's killed a few hours later so i quickly eat some of that tinned army meat just to give me a little bit of strength don't forget i've been casting and we move out and i hear the deputy commander of my co company give out the commander he says this is muscat that was his code name go to your positions and open fire that's it end so I run to, to my tank and I quickly get into my tank and I join the force. And I can already see a burning tank from my actually company. I can already see four fatalities of my command already there. And I can hear that the, the art, artillery is, is hitting straight at us. The Egyptian artillery is already hitting my tank. And, and just as you can hear it, like on a hot tin roof, it's all, it's full fawning. And believe me, I try and hit back. We seemed absolutely stupid. It should never have happened. And now that's my feeling. And I can actually hear the Egyptian firearms and everything all around me. Now, why did the, the war catch you like that? Well, Zamir was here. And what's his name? Zaira. He explained it. I'm, in my humble opinion, what do you want to hear my humble opinion for? Why should I explain it? Read my book. You've read my book. Thank you. Emmanuel, before we... Uh, okay. I'll be uh, brief. Uh, in, during the, the hard, very difficult three days of the war, uh, I didn't have any kind of um, 
uh, suicidal uh, thoughts. Um, there weren't any. The military was very well trained, just like a Prussian army, as, as long as they, they could see the uh, battalion commander in the lead, everybody was behind him. No problem at all. Despite all the casualties, there was no sense of, of uh, uh, loss and complete destruction at all, which afterwards I realized that did exist in the top echelons. Now, towards the end of the war, we were parked around Geneva, and uh, Chaim Guri came up to me. He's an old friend of mine. And uh, the tanks look as, it, as tanks look at the end of a war, uh, all beaten up and, and torn up, but the people were made of steel. And he was sitting there with this long face, and I said to him, Chaim, uh, what's happened? And he said to me, you don't know what's happening in, in Israel. And he was right. And therefore, you know, the regular army was excellent. It was well trained. And we, we saw what happens when a, a, an army which isn't well trained goes into war. I don't want to say when. But the regular army was at a very good condition. And even when uh, I remained at the uh, Mittler Junction alone, I didn't feel lost at all. And when I um, heard the armored uh, vehicles coming towards me. It was a very distinct uh, sound of the uh, particular armored vehicles. Uh, and I heard them coming and I said to myself, it's going to be all right. I'm getting reinforcement. It's going to be all right. And I said to, to everyone, it's going to be all right. And when they, people see you in the turret and that you're together with them, people believe in you. And on the third day, some soldier came up to me and said, Commander, Commander, there's uh, also uh, war in the Golan Heights. And I said to him, fine, I don't care. You focus on what you need to do. And this is what you do when you're well trained.